Morning, everyone. So uh, we'll start off dealing with a very timely issue. Uh, how many of you knew that next month the FDA uh, is going to be under statutory obligation to define what a cyber device is? We've all heard you know, the cybersecurity requirements and so forth. Were you aware of that? So some significant changes are, are going to be coming very soon in terms of defining things. So let's start off looking at what the term cyber means uh, in, in the world today. We all use it, you know, cyber attack, cyber secure, uh, et cetera. So when we break down uh, all these terms and, and look at the root, we see that cybersecurity comes from the Greeks. It comes from the word uh, Kubernetes. And that has to do with the steersman. And uh, it led to a discipline called cybernetics, which has to do with communication across many different uh, domains of, of science and technology. So when we think about a steersman today, there's something very different that we see. We see things like telemedicine and uh, telesurgery, even transatlantic uh, telesurgery, as we've seen with telerobotics and so forth. And so what it means to steer is kind of a different thing in today's technology domain. And when we, uh -oh, um, <clears throat> so when we look at the domain of the internet and communication of data, we see that there are a lot of interconnected things. We see that we have um, industrial products connected to things. When we look at a hospital, you know, it's not just medical devices, as we all know, right? We have backup generators and, and all kinds of different building management systems that may be on common networks with our, our clinical systems as well. And when we look at those technologies, we see that they fall into a domain of communication that in many ways is like real estate. Now, if you take a plot of land and you try to decide how to utilize that you know, as, as a business, let's say, you can choose to put a house on that land. You can choose to put an apartment building on that land. And these different choices that you make uh, have many implications in terms of how that, that property is utilized. Computational technology is really not, not a lot different. You know, we talk about the cloud a lot today. We talk about the edge a lot today. You know, we have things like wearables that sit out on the edge or the periphery of centralized cloud-based data repositories and so forth. But we also have this, this kind of nebulous area that some people call the fog. And so when we see that, we start to, to understand that there are a lot of buzzwords and marketing terms and things like that that are thrown out to help us define the different economic models of how this technology is used. Some people want to use servers that they uh, pay for, you know, from a, a service provider, a cloud service provider, for example. Some people want to use platforms that they can just put their data into. And so there are a lot of different models where you use and or rent or purchase different portions of this technology to attain different goals. But ultimately, you want to have different parts of the healthcare ecosystem being able to communicate with each other. And that healthcare ecosystem is not just the medical device. It's not just what's in the hospital. It's everything, all the way to the home, all the way to what you're wearing on your wrist or around your neck in terms of wearables. So we can see that these technologies are now designed in a way to allow us to put almost anything on this thing we call the internet. We can start to acquire data from it. We can hook up little chips to things and little sensors that allow us to monitor everything that's going on in electromechanical devices that we may be familiar with, mechanical devices that we may be familiar with, and even biological systems that all of you with the many MDs that are out here are very, very familiar with. But the technology stack that supports it is not simple. It's complex in and of itself. Much like the system that you're monitoring, the system that is 
conveying this information has its own levels of complexity associated with it. And so we have to understand how that technology stack works to support the objectives that you want to reach from a clinical utility perspective. And this starts to build what we call the medical internet of things or internet of medical things. Uh, there isn't strong consensus yet, uh, but it really is the amalgam of a lot of different technologies that enable communication and enable the steersmanship, getting the data from point A to point B in a way that, that's trustworthy, that's reliable, that's useful. And there are many different pros and cons that come up when you, when you decide how to use that plot of real estate, that computational technology that you have to think about. You have to think about, you know, do I need reliability? Do I need to make sure that data gets from point A to point B? Or do I need speed? Do I need to be able to respond to changes in, in situations really quickly? So let's take a look at a specific example um, to, to see how some of this works. Many of you work with devices. Uh, just curious, how many people have actually taken devices apart and, and looked at the internals and, and how things were? So good, a, a good number of you. And that's why I, I thought it'd be really fun to speak at an anesthesiology con conference because you guys are the tinkerers of the medical world, I think. So anyway, we'll take a look at a software-enabled ventilator, which most are, are these days. Let's think about why would we need an IoT ventilator? Why do we need this on as part of the Internet of Things? I think COVID taught us that, that very well recently. You know, you may want to be able to make changes to critical parameters and things like that uh, without necessarily getting too close to the patient in some cases in order to protect uh, healthcare worker safety. So let's take a look at what it is that we need to build to make this IoT ventilator. Well, first of all, we have to understand the control structure that we're working with, because engineering is largely about controlling things and building uh, ways to control things in a human intervened manner. And so when we look at breathing, you know, we have inspiration, expiration, and oxygenation. That's the basic finite state machine at the bottom. And then we have a whole bunch of things like chemoreceptors, proprioceptors, the brain, et cetera, that, that drive all of this. And in order to get us there, we need to convert that human physiological anatomical system into an engineered electromechanical system. And we need to be able to control that inspiration, expiration, and... Um, oxygenation in very much the same way. But, but we have to be able to do that in a way that's compensatory for deficiencies of the human body. And that's what this remote controlled ventilator is all about. And so what are our targets? We have some critical parameters we have to look at. We have things like flow, pressure, and volume that we have to replicate very, very closely to what the human body normally does. These are things that, that maybe you guys do every day, but maybe you, you don't think about the fact that that's really what you're doing when you're hooking somebody up to the ventilator. And so in order to accomplish this, you have to have a plan. You have to have a methodology to follow to get you there. And to follow a methodology, you have to have good process. You know that, that saying, if you plan, uh, I'm sorry, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. And so having a good systems engineering process up front that includes uh, what was mentioned earlier, both system one and system two, not only the machines, but the humans as well, can be very critical. And so you start choosing technology, you start selecting appropriate technologies, like what kind of microprocessor do you want to put your software in that's going to try to create this waveform? And as you do that, um, you start to, to really dissect and understand the pros and cons of your technology selection. Am I going to get the right kind of feedback when my motor is moving? Am I going to have some way of monitoring the, the movement of that motor?
to make sure that I'm creating the right amount of pressure, the right change in volume, the right flow rate, et cetera. And so you start putting these things together and you start to create an engineered product or system that starts to replicate those critical parametric changes you need in the human body. And to get to this, you start to think about, well, how do I use this in my day-to-day -day practice of medicine? How do I use this in a way that allows me to remotely control the things I need to control? And so you start tacking on more technologies on there. You start to add in um, things like a front end, something that allows you to have local control, something that allows you to also have remote control. You have to figure out which should override which. Should my local override my remote or should my remote override my local? Uh, you have to think about how do I use available technologies out there? Do I use um, cloud service providers? You know, do I use um, on-premise services? Uh, do I use my own server and my, and my facility uh, that I'm providing service through as, as an independent vendor, for example? So a lot of different decisions to make and a lot of different ways to compartmentalize this effort. So when we start to look at this now from a technology perspective um, in the application, we say, okay, well, I know I have to inspire, I have to expire, I have to oxygenate. I've picked some technologies to do that. Um, but what can go wrong? You know, where could disturbances come into this control structure that could cause problems for me? Well, that gets back to, to understanding causation versus association like we just talked about and so forth. And we need to start doing some analysis. There are various levels of sophistication of this kind of analysis, uh, but there are some very, very simple tools and models that anybody can use. It doesn't matter if you're a clinician with no engineering background or an engineer with no clinical background. Um, some of these tools are pretty straightforward and easy to understand. One is, is what you see here called hazard-based safety engineering, where what you do is you understand what is the potentially hazardous source could be a chemical, it could be you know, some type of energy source like electricity, et cetera. What is the part of the body or what's a susceptible part that may be harmed? And then what is the transfer mechanism? How does that hazardous source impinge upon negatively the susceptible part? And how do you stop that? Do you change the design? Do you make the susceptible part less susceptible? Can you maybe do none of those things? And then you have to uh, rely on, on warning and labeling and, and letting people know, you know this could be a problem, be careful when you're using this technology. So these are all the kinds of considerations you have to go through um, when figuring out how to make this technology safe and secure. And there are tools out there that even help with the data piece of it. So it's not just building the physical stuff, it's looking at the data flows. Now, where's my data going? Well, it's starting out in my vent ventilator, or maybe it's ending up in my ventilator, where I have to control those critical parameters like pressure, flow, and volume. Then it's going through some kind of front end, like a PLC that has maybe a, a human machine interface on it that somebody is changing parameters on. It may then be going out to a server. And in all these places where I'm sending this data, it's also getting stored there. So it's getting stored at the edge or at the device. It's getting stored maybe on a mobile device like your phone or an app that's in your phone. It's getting stored in your cloud service providers environment. So somewhere out in this nebulous thing we call the cloud, or maybe it's getting stored in this thing we call the fog these days, which um, is something in between the edge and the cloud. It's, it's more computational infrastructure. Again, it's taking that plot of real estate and dividing it up in yet another different way. So when we think about what could go wrong, we end up in places like villi, ventilator-induced lung injury, right? Because we know if we deviate from that pressure flow and volume, bad things could happen. We could get inflammation and uh, edema, restriction of, of, uh, of space for movement of those anatomical structures that need to move. We could get cell disruption and, and cell death 
or we could go as far as multi-system organ failure and patient death, which is a place we absolutely don't want to end up. And so as we start to understand this technology, it's really important for us to understand uh, what are all the different kinds of impacts that could happen from it. You know, you don't think a lot about motor-operated medical devices necessarily catching on fire, but they can. You know, we have a long 100-plus year history of protecting devices from catching on fire. But now, with cyber devices, you could actually get into a device and you could allow it to try to move the motor, but without turning that electrical energy fully into mechanical energy to, to cause rotation of the motor by disabling some of the motor windings through software. Well, if you do that, you end up with a, a coil, a motor winding, that you're sending energy to. That energy is not getting dissipated as mechanical movement. Instead, you're creating an inductive heater. That heater starts heating up, your ventilator starts heating up, you exceed the plastic for flame ratings and things like that. Next thing you know, your device is on fire. So threat actors, hackers, can do this kind of thing. It's not common, but it is possible. Something a little more common is exfiltrating data. So when you design your device, you know, you just spent a whole lot of time um, tweaking the motor movement and so forth to get your pressure flow and volume working uh, just the right way to replicate what the human body normally does. Well, you might have spent easily a decade doing that. Well, now what? You put your device on the market. You don't secure the data inside. Somebody steals those algorithms, knockoff products get on the market. Maybe they're less, uh, less expensive, uh, less safe, et cetera. And so depending on the regulatory environment it's being sold in, again, patient safety could be at risk. And so we see that these kinds of things can be addressed. Technology keeps advancing. You know, we're going from external ventilators to now uh, research is being done on implantable ventilators and things like that. So things are always moving. Um, luckily, there are standards that are emerging. Unfortunately, they're always a little bit behind that try to address these kinds of risks. They try to detect what these risks are that we need to think about. This is where, you know, right now we have a lot of engineers usually sitting in these rooms working on these standards. It would be great to get folks like you, the members of, of APSF, for instance, more involved in this so that we can get more of that clinical input. Um, this will enable us then to get to aspirational goals like we see uh, through some of this research that was done at MGH uh, through some of Dr. Goldman's research efforts, uh, who's in the room here, where we can get to closed loop healthcare that, that ranges from the home with wearable technologies and monitoring technologies through the hospital uh, where care is provided back into the home where care can continue to be provided through activities like hospital uh, in the home, for instance, that's happening now. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll be doing questions in a panel format, I believe. <laughs>